I just wanted to, um, you know, acknowledge everybody for taking time to be with us this uh, beautiful uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, today we've got a fascinating talk. I'm really excited about it, and I'm sure you guys are too. So uh, just for quick um, house rules, um, you will notice that once you are on this platform on Zoom, um, there's a little mute button for your for your microphone, we would like everybody to please make sure that all their mics are muted at this point in time. Um, and also just to make sure that it remains muted for the duration of the talk. You will also notice that there's kind of um, several options that you get on Zoom, uh, things like Q&A. Uh, at the Q&A section, that is the section where you are able to pose some of the questions that you'd like to ask Mr. Rupert a little bit later on. So please feel free to do so. You also have an option to raise a hand. Uh, you can raise a hand. We'll acknowledge uh, one round of, of, of hands at the end of the talk. And we will also take some of the questions uh, directly from Zoom. So with those um, house rules checked in, I see the numbers are going up quite nicely. Uh, we're not going to waste any more time. Uh, we're going to just jump right into it. and. Um, Allow me to say today, I have this awesome privilege to welcome Mr. Rupert Watson. He was born in England, but has lived in Kenya for over 40 years, where he practices variably as a lawyer, mediator, naturalist, and writer. His work has taken him to many parts of Africa, providing every opportunity to indulge his lifelong fascination of birds. He has authored several books, including The Africa, Baobab, and Culture Clash, and has written many articles largely on natural history for a wide range of publications. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely exciting. Without any waste of time, uh, if we were all together, I'd ask everybody to clap hands. But imagine this clapping of hands, uh, Mr. Watson. <laughs> and please, you, without any further ado, Take it over, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Are you hearing me all right? We are hearing you perfectly, go on ahead. Thank you for your introduction, John, and greetings to everybody from sunny Nairobi. Um, I've had, I'm having this opportunity to talk to you on the back of having written a book. Um, and authors lose no opportunity for self-promotion. And so you can see the cover of the book on my first slide. As John said, yes, I was born in the north of England and I've been in Kenya for over 40 years. Um, but actually my first visit to Africa was in 1966. And I went to work my first of many gap years. I spent on a farm in Klokalan in the Free State, close to Masiru. Um, aged 17, I had other birds on my mind in those days, uh, but I always remember how proud my employers were of the fact that on their farm, bald ibises, which are a very unusual bird, they would come just occasionally and they would land only on one field, which was a permanent pasture, um, and probably having flown over from the Maluti Mountains in Lesotho. So I put that down, age 17, as my first really significant bird experience in Africa. And as I say, that was in Klokalan in the Free State. Uh, thereafter, since I've been in, in Kenya, I've visited South Africa from time to time. Uh, and particularly when I was researching uh, the uh, last book I wrote for Strike, which was the African Baobab. And that research took me to the Kirsten Bosch Library. And it's really nice to be able to give something back to Kirsten Bosch by talking to you all today, because I know a lot of you are connected with the, the gardens there. And I also distinctly remember when walking around the garden, seeing a Cape sugar bird which we don't have up here. And what I remember even more was the fact that it was feeding on a white Lear notice. 
the Lear notices we have up here are all red and orange, and I'd never seen a white one before. And after feeding on the Lear notice, it flew off onto a Pratea. So those were happy memories and lovely to be back with you folks from Kirsten Bosch. So um, now if I move on to the book a bit, um, we've got a book here called Peacocks and Picathartes. Well, my lovely editor Pippa and her colleagues all wanted to use the title Peacocks and Picathartes. And I said, well, you know, peacock implies a Indian bird. Picathartes, nobody knows what a Picathartes is anyway. Uh, so why don't we have hornbills and honey guides or hardy dars and hammer cops or some such? And um, they said, no, no, we think that's much better and we'll give you a subtitle. Um, and now I completely agree with them. Um, the peacock is an extraordinary bird. I'm going to read a little bit about it. It's the Congo peacock, nothing to do with the Indian peacock. And here, showing how extraordinary it is, it actually features on a, on a Hungarian stamp, of all things. It's endemic to the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's been on their stamps, but I thought it was fairly bizarre that it was also um, on a Hungarian stamp. Um, and there's a very nice drawing of it by Peter Blackwell, who did the lovely drawings uh, in, in my book. Picathartes is an equally extraordinary bird, um, and there we can see Peter's drawing and a photograph, um, also known as a rock fowl. They, they locomote by leaping and jumping. Um, and one of the most extraordinary things about them is that they nest under an overhang, a completely flat overhang. They may build a cup-shaped nest um, and they can't hover and put mud in it like a swallow or a martin. And nobody knows to this day how they managed to build that nest underneath a completely flat bit of rock. So also wonderful birds. And indeed, I think the title does stimulate and provoke interest and queries and questions. So the book itself, I wanted to be a, a celebration of African diversity of, of birds. Um, and I don't dwell too long on all the threats and dangers that face wild creatures and their environment these days. Um, but rather I try and focus on what's really special on our continent and why we should try so hard to protect it. And uh, the way I've done this is after the introduction, I have a little section on each what I call African bird family. And um, by that I, I define an African bird family as a family of birds, all of whose members breed on this continent. Uh, and only on this continent. Little bit of exception, you can find a hammercock in Arabia. Um, and then I have some families that are mainly African, and that's slightly subjective. Uh, honey guides, there's two species of honey guide which aren't in Africa. Uh, cysticulars, there's one or two of those outside this continent, sand grouse. But all of those almost certainly evolved in Africa and spread outwards subsequently. Um, the next chapter, I've been totally self-indulgent and picked six birds, which I think really epitomize this continent, which didn't find their way in earlier. Like um, we didn't have a wild fowl, so I put in an Egyptian goose as a chapter on that. And we didn't have raptors, so that's where we have battler and fish eagle. Uh, and also the, the Congo peacock is, comes in there. And then I close with a closing chapter. And I also have a little chapter at the end about the works of the early writers on ornithology, which have really been one of my main inspirations. Uh, and I'll talk more about them later. Um, so that's the sort of structure and within each of the, the, the chapters that I've written, 
you, I draw on sort of four different sources. Um, and I'm afraid I have to have a bit of taxonomy. Taxonomy can be very dry, but because I'm talking about a family of birds, I've really got to say who's in that family. So um, ostriches, for instance, we now, the source that I use says that we have two species of ostrich. Now you're very well, you know ostriches down in South Africa better than anybody. But there's now two there's a common ostrich but there's also a somali ostrich uh, which is in northern kenya somalia and ethiopia and it has much bluer the male has much bluer neck and uh, legs as you can see there um, and actually perversely ostriches only creep into this book because they have been very recently extirpated all over Arabia. They've been shot by people in fast cars and machine guns. And so now they are quintessentially African. But within a hundred years ago, they most certainly weren't. They were far more widespread. Uh, let's just take a grand hornbill as another example of taxonomic juggling. Uh, Grand hornbills are no longer in the hornbill family, according to my source. Um, and we have two species of grand hornbill, uh, northern and um, Abyssin and southern. And um, the, the, what they differ in many ways, as you can imagine. That they, one of the things they don't do is seal up their nests like other hornbills do, sealing their male seals the female into a hole in the tree where she incubates the eggs. Um, oxpeckers too, they used to be classed as starlings, um, but now they have their own family, which again only has two species in it. Um, and here we have the red build, uh, the other species being the yellow build delightful picture of them uh, posing on a hippo's nose, which is something that I've never seen. Um, then as well as some taxonomy, uh, I talk about recent scientific um, research and so on, and how various discoveries have been made. And um, one of the things that interested me most there was when researching greater honey guides. Uh, there's been a lot of research lately on how greater honey guides interact with humans. So the humans actually try and call up the honey guide in order to get it to lead them to a nest. But honey guides are brood parasites in that, like cuckoos, they lay their eggs in, in, in other birds' nests. And in the case of the greater honey guide, particularly um, in holes in trees in barbets nests. And one thing that they found recently is that the young greater honey guide, which the female drops an egg and disappears, the young greater honey guide is born with a, with a hook on the end of its beak. And that hook is there simply to kill the step siblings. Um, of the, the, the bird that built the nest, so that by the time um, the hook drops off, there is only one bird in the nest, and that is the honey guide. Uh, pretty horrific. Um, th this honey guide, by the way, um, travels under the Latin name of indicator indicator, which I think is so delightful. And um, it is the only species, probably, which guides humans to the uh, to bees' nests. Now, my next source of of for, for my book is is early, early ornithological writings, um, and and I just like you to imagine arriving in a foreign land in seventeen fifty sixty whatever after months on a boat from Europe, no bird book, no binoculars, and starting to try and make some sense out of Southern African bird life. Um, the French and Dutch uh, 
and Portuguese were much earlier down the west coast of Africa. So there was some earlier research done, particularly by French. But the earliest researches in the English language all, all started in, in South Africa. Um, and one of my favorite um, writers, and I'm going to read you a snippet from what he wrote, was a very interesting uh, medical, Swedish medical doctor. Sorry, there's the honey bird, we missed him. Um, and, but he's relevant still. There's the Swedish medical doctor, Anders Sparman. And he came to the Cape in the 1770s um, as, a, as a medical doctor, but he was also very interested in birds and wrote beautifully. And he captured a specimen, you had to shoot them in those days, of the greater honey guide, which he thought was a cuckoo not because it laid its eggs in other birds' nests, he didn't know that, but because of the shape of its feet. Cuckoos and honey guides have their middle two toes pointing forwards and their back two toes pointing backwards. They're, sorry, their outside two toes. So you've got the two middle ones pointing forwards and the first and the fourth pointing backwards. That's why he thought it was a cuckoo. Anyway, he described his journey into the Eastern Cape in the 1777 Journal of the Royal Society. Sorry, I'll just wait for the aeroplane to pass. Um, and, and, and his description is absolutely charming. And I'd ask you to, to bear with me for this. The Dutch settlers thereabouts have given this bird the name of Honigweitzer, or honey guide from its quality of discovering wild honey to travelers. Its color has nothing striking or beautiful, and its size is considerably smaller than that of our cuckoo in Europe. But in return, the instinct which prompts it to seek its food in a singular manner is truly admirable. Not only the Dutch and the Hottentots, but likewise a species of quadruped, which the Dutch name a ratel, are frequently conducted to wild beehives by this bird, which as it were, pilots them to the very spot. Then he goes on after a break. If the honey guide should happen to have gained a considerable way before the men, who may easily be hindered in the pursuit by bushes, rivers, and the like, it returns to them again and redoubles its note as if to reproach them with their inactivity. At last the bird is observed to hover for a few minutes over a certain spot and then silently retiring to a neighboring bush or other resting place, the hunters are sure of finding the bee's nest in that identical spot. I think that's charming and that's written in 1777. Thank you, Mr. Sparman. Now, another fascinating uh, early ornithologist in the Cape, which will be probably a lot better known to you than me, was Francois Le Vailon, um, who arrived in 1781 after a very um, tortuous journey, which ended up with the Dutch um, captain of his ship, the Middleburg, scuppering the ship in Cape Harbour, I think, in order to avoid it being captured by the British fleet. Le Vailant lost all his stuff, had to re-equip himself um, uh, before setting off on one of uh, the first of three major journeys around the Cape area. Uh, he was a colourful fellow. That's the, on the right there is a cuckoo, which is still known as Le Vailant's cuckoo. Um, he had a tame baboon apparently called Kakis. Um, he's said to have fallen in love with his servant whose name he couldn't pronounce so he christened her Nerina uh, after whom is named Nerina's Trogon still to this day um, and having appended his own name to the violence cuckoo when he found another cuckoo that he wanted to name um, he used 
the name of his uh, male helper, Class, uh, and he christened it Class's Cuckoo, and there's Class and there's the Cuckoo, uh, and it still is Class's Cuckoo to this day. And so he made a, an incredible contribution to African ornithology, um, and be it all in French, and he went back to France and worked on the first exclusively African book on, on African bird life and produced in 1806 uh, six volumes of the Histoire Naturelle des Oiseaux d'Afrique, um, and which had magnificent colored illustrations and it really was a fine work. And as I say, the first work exclusively devoted to African bird life. And just before I close on, on this, these early people, I'd like to just take a, a jump 150 years forwards um, and just mention an extraordinary man who you may take for granted in South Africa, but Austin Roberts and his groundbreaking book, Birds of South Africa. Um, first of all, Roberts was a product of his own country. He wasn't an administrator come out from overseas and so on. He was born in Pretoria and worked in the Transvaal Museum for most of his life. Um, he amassed a huge collection of specimens and named many of the birds and identified them and had Norman Lighton paint a lot of them for his book. And his book was published first in 1940 simultaneously in Johannesburg and London. So it really was a product of Africa. And it was also really and truly a handbook. And it's been continuously in print ever since. And it's now in its seventh edition, slightly enlarged its scope. Um, but it now travels under the name of Birds of Southern Africa. Um, and Roberts can be really credited with helping to further the devolution of African ornithology away from Europe down to Africa. And also he must have made tens of thousands of bird watchers out of people who had no interest in birds until they picked up his book. So, so all, all credit to, to Roberts. Um, really terrific, terrific uh, man. And as I say, you probably take him for granted, but don't, his, his work is really special. Um, so my, my fourth um, source of information um, and of what I've, my writing is some personal experiences. Um, and I'm going to read you uh, a chunk out of my book. It's about seven or eight minutes, so bear with me. Um, and it's uh, about the Congo peacock. Um, because I think this story melds taxonomy, science, adventure, uh, some personal experience, all, all into, excuse me. There goes my, there goes my last page. Um, all into one. So bear with me while I read you, I'll try and remember to change the slide halfway through, um, about the Congo peacock. In 1913, young American ornithologist James Chapin was exploring the then Belgian Congo with a zoological expedition from the American Museum of Natural History. Near Avakubi in the northeast of the country, he spotted one of its inhabitants wearing a traditional headdress adorned with a distinctive brown banded feather. Curious as to the plume's origins, the American asked if he could keep it. Among the 23,000 vertebrate specimens collected in the six-year expedition were many birds. But on returning to New York, it became quite clear that none of their skins sported a feather remotely like the one Chapin had acquired. In 1936, he was still Associate Curator of Ornithology at the Museum of Natural History, and in the course of researching his Birds of the Belgian Congo, found himself in Belgium's Tervuren Museum. 
There, while poking around unlabeled specimens, he unearthed two large bedraggled stuffed birds. They had little tufts on their crown and almost bare throats with much bluey green plumage that had once shone with iridescence but was now dulled by time and dust. Records showed these birds to have been presented to the museum by the rubber trade in Kasai Company in 1914. Victims of the staff's ignorance, they'd been consigned to obscurity. But Chapin saw at once that the brown secondary feathers of the female bird, flecked with distinctive black markings, perfectly matched the anonymous feather he'd carefully preserved since collecting it 20 years earlier. The following year, having tested his employer's indulgence still further, Chapin was back in the Congo. There, from a forest mining camp east of Kisangani, he succeeded in obtaining several specimens of what he was to name the Congo peacock. Common sense dictated that despite its name, the peacock's closest relative should also be in Africa, and most likely the guinea fowl, which are endemic to the continent. Nevertheless, Chapin held out against both common sense and scientific opinion, concluding that this bird is more closely allied to the true peacocks, and we fail to see that it shows any tendency to approach the guinea fowls. DNA analysis now shows Chapin's convictions to have been fully vindicated while at the same time raising a host of questions about the peacock's common ancestors and their distribution at a time when both the map and climate of our planet were very different from that today. So Chapin was saying the closest relative of the Congo peacock is the peacock in India. It's not a bird in Africa. And here I'm going to quote from the authors of the Birds of Africa, which is seven volumes, and volume two was published in 1986. And they considered that the discovery of Afro Parvo was one of the most sensational ornithological events of the 20th century, not merely because such a large and conspicuous bird had eluded discovery in an area reasonably well surveyed but also because of the implications of its Asiatic affinities. Okay, now then we're going to um, move to present day DRC. Um, the Congo peacock's very patchy distribution has now been better mapped and shows it confined to the relatively undisturbed forests of the DRC. In 2014, an invitation to help the African Wildlife Foundation improve relations between the local communities and the Congolese conservation authorities in and around Lamarco Reserve provided me with a wonderful chance to visit an area where both bonobos and peacocks were supposedly locally common. To get there entailed first taking the weekly plane to Basankusu. 800 miles northeast of Kinshasa. And there's two rivers join at Basankusu, and it's just upstream of that slide, of the picture there. Basankusu is the main outlet for produce from the upstream forest, which if you live in, you live off. I dodged between the tea stalls to the covered market off the main street, and the range of such produce was only too apparent. Is as if vetting visitors, a woman with a baby on her back wielded a large blooded knife over the carcass of a crocodile. Next door was the smoked monkey stand, tiny primate bodies splayed out on wooden frames, while the elongated hooves of the end of a dismembered carcass proclaimed the identity of that lovely aquatic antelope, Sitatunga. Further on, women dispensed, dispensed cups full of caterpillars or wrapped slithering black catfish in banana leaves. But no one was selling dead birds, and yes, I have to admit to a sneaking wish to find a female peacock carcass on sale and to be able to pluck out the same secondary wing feather that Chapin had nurtured 
for 20 years before his eureka moment in that Brussels museum. From Basankusu to the reserve took about 14 hours in a dugout canoe. And when we finally reached there in the dark, I was disappointed to hear that there were no peacocks around the headquarters. However, at the end of my assignment came the chance to visit AME, a research center half a day away. The incumbent scientist promised us bonobo sightings as long as we could get up at 3 a.m. and walk two hours to their nest sites. But when I asked about the peacocks, her reply was a dispiriting and perhaps inevitable, oh, you should have been here last week. Once I was back from the bonobos, I spent the rest of that day and the whole of the next searching around where she'd last seen them. I saw some splendid hornbills, but no sign of peacocks. If vocalizing is a signal of activity, the birds seem most active at night and many of the forest guards I spoke to told how they could set their watches by the 8 p.m. calls that began to penetrate the silence on the hour. And indeed, on our last night, amongst the scrape and clatter of metal cutlery on metal plates, one of the Congolese researchers suddenly bade us quiet. Yes, not far from the camp, two peacocks were indulging in a raucous vocal exchange. So off I set with torches, guides and good wishes, but no sign of the birds, which had flapped off into the distance in the dark. Still, one always has to leave something for next time. And this is where I have to admit having been back to Lamarco the following year and still not seen. So that is the Congo peacock, extraordinary bird, all sorts of different dimensions to that story. Um, and I'm going to now move on to talk about two things that I learned a lot about when I was researching my book. Two things that I really had no idea about. Um, and those are, first of all, the role of the museum scientists, the role that they played in classification and researches. And then I'm going to talk quickly about the, um, what we've learned about African bird behavior from the um, study of captive birds. So, um, Let's move on now to the role of the museum scientist. Uh, just imagine what it was like, 1700s, 1800s. You had dozens, hundreds of explorers, biologists, administrators, all, all over Africa. Some of them professional naturalists, some, a lot of them amateur observers they were all collecting specimens of flora and fauna. And these had to be compared and identified and named. And the same species was probably being consigned to many different European museums at the same time, or if not at the same time, then over the course of, of years. And the essential role of European and also American scientists in making some sense of this mass of information can was it was a major essential contribution to the whole study of not only ornithology so if we take the hammer cop the first the first hammer cop to be caught killed skin skin sent back to a european museum would almost certainly have been from west africa where early explorers would have probably found one in Senegal, ships, captains, whatever, um, and they'd have sent it back to a Paris museum uh, or French museum uh, for research there. Further south, later on, someone arrives in South Africa. They find a hammercock. They send a skin of a hammercock back to a British museum or maybe a Dutch museum. Um, Somebody else, meanwhile, is in Arabia and, and, and finds a hammer cop uh, nesting on a cliff in Arabia. That goes back to a different museum. And all of these specimens had, had to somewhere 
someone had to make sense of all that information. And these were the museum scientists who very often never left their museums. And um, they had to try and work out what were the Hammercock's closest relatives. They had to try and link the specimen they got from Southern Africa, West Africa, Arabia, and, and discover that that in fact was the same bird. Um, and then they'd have to try and look out for the Hammercock's closest relatives. So was the Hammercock in fact closely related to the shoebill? because it had a slightly similar beak? Um, or was the development of those beaks just to parallel evolution in response to the need to fish in similar circumstances? And that they weren't related at all. And then somebody even suggested that, that the, the, there's the hardy well, not the hammercock, that the, um, that the hammercock's beak was actually evolved in order to help it build a nest and had nothing to do with fishing. So you had all of this information and it had to make some sense. And just to, to pick one individual, um, not least because he's in America, which is a lot harder to get specimens because very few Americans were roaming around Africa. They had to buy a lot of specimens. John Cassin. Um, was a Quaker, a businessman, and unpaid curator of the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences. And he described nearly 200 species from all over the world. And from the African ones, I think he must have got a big collection of birds from West Africa, because we have still, we have Cassin's spinetail, Cassin's honeybird, Cassin's hawk eagle, Cassin's malimbi, which is that bird on the right is there. And he never traveled to Africa, but he just ably demonstrated how effective taxonomy relied not only on the efforts of collectors in the field, but also people back in their museums, in often rather dusty and difficult surrounds. Um, and it was a very sad end John Casson had because a the skins were, had to be treated with some sort of chemical to preserve them. Um, and they were treated in this case with um, a chemical mixture that included arsenic. Uh, and Cassin um, succumbed to arsenic poisoning at the age only of uh, 55. So anyway, that's one of the things I picked up very much during, this, during my researches of what a debt we owe to these museum scientists. Now the other thing I'm just going to touch on is observations of birds in captivity. And this gives me an opportunity to, to, to tell what I think is a wonderful story about, about watching sand grass. Uh, as, 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 as anyone who's watched either in life or on film, lucky if they've seen it in life, male sand grass coming in to soak up their breasts and flying back to water their chicks. They can't help but be touched by this, this life-sustaining practice. But this phenomenon was first publicized by a splendidly named uh, Englishman called Edmund Gustavo Neid Waldo who lived most of his life in Kent in England, in Hever Castle. And he had, you could buy birds from traders in London in particular quite easily. And he had um, pintail sand grouse in, in, in his aviary. And this note I'm gonna read you, which again, I think is wonderful. So please bear with me appeared in an 1896 issue of a magazine called The Zoologist. And I think it's fascinating for more than the revelation of males sand grass soak their breast feathers to water their young. This is someone watching sand grass in captivity in their aviary at their home. So he starts, the number of eggs laid were four. And I removed one, knowing that three eggs are the proper complement. Incubation was commenced by the cock, 
who went on the nest the evening of the day the third egg was laid, his place being taken next morning by the hen. And this arrangement was kept up all during the incubation, which lasted 23 days, viz. the cock sitting all night and the hen all day. To my mind, this is an extremely interesting fact. The brightly plumaged cock sitting during the dark hours and the hen with her protective colouring sitting during the day. As soon as the young were out of the nest, when 12 hours old, a very curious habit developed itself in the male. He would rub his breast violently up and down on the ground, a motion quite distinct from dusting, and when all awry he would get into his drinking water and saturate the feathers of the underparts. When soaked, he would go through the motions of flying away, nodding his head, etc. Then, remembering his family were close by, would run up to the hen, make a demonstration, when the young would run out, get under him, and suck the water from his breast. This is no doubt the way that water is conveyed to the young when hatched far out on waterless plains. And I think that's just a lovely and incredibly observant description. Um, but it took him, he couldn't persuade anybody, um, and it took him another 70 years before uh, a very readable paper by two South Africans, Cade and McLean, um, about transport of water by adult sand grouse, which detailed their observations in Gemsbok National Park, actually brought the evidence uh, in clear sight to, to everybody. But that's just one example of what you could learn in, by watching birds in captivity. There's a wonderful description of, of um, there's the same uh, drawing there. There's a wonderful description of, of the nesting of a hardy dar, ibis, which comes from Disney's animal kingdom in Florida. And, and reading about how the hardy dar ibises would eat mealworms thrown out for carmine bee eaters and the male lunging at a superb stunt starling or chasing a hammer cop from the vicinity of the nest. You'd think it was all happening in Africa, but this was in Disney's Animal Kingdom in Florida. Uh, down in South Africa, a lady called um, uh, M.K. Rowan published a paper on coleys, mouse birds of South Africa, a lot of which uh, detailed evidence found from the behavior of, of mouse birds in captivity and also particularly interestingly from the way that wild mouse birds would come up to the cage and they'd try and preen each other, the one outside preening one inside. And she learned a lot about mouse birds from the interaction of, of, um, of them as well. So um, I think I better, I've got one or two more stories I want to tell, but I think I better ask Belinda um, and John, if I'm running out of time, and then I'll know whether they're hearing me. Uh, am I running out of time? Or can, um, I, tell, can I tell a couple more stories? Um, Mr. Watson, we can go for two or three more stories and then we can wrap it up. You're doing Fine. really good for time. Fine, we'll have a couple more stories, right. Um, my the the um the editors of my book were very very flexible in allowing me to indulge in some rather zany deviations from the male from the main topic so here's just a couple of uh stories that um maybe i won't tell them all but i would r recommend you find out more about um, here's a, uh, a hammer cop's nest with actually a Vero's eagles taking it over. You can see the Vero's eagles on top. Well, hammer cops are rather like European magpies. They collect all sorts of bright things and, and store them away in their nest. 
and their nests are also prone to dissection from people who want to work out how many branches and bits of stuff there are in a hammercock's nest. I think I read once that there were over 8,000 in one nest. But anyway, there was a Zimbabwean lawyer and politician called Clarkson Treadgold who dismantled the hammercock's nest, principally, I think, looking for the brightly colored bits and pieces inside it. And one of the things he found were a couple of tram tickets, a red and a blue bus ticket, uh, issued a hundred miles away from the nest. And that set him thinking, heavens above, do these, these, these hammer cops, they go foraging away up to a hundred miles. Um, and, and this threatened to be the start of uh, revolutionary re revelations of, of, of hammer cop behavior, that they didn't forage at home, but they went all over the place. Um, until somebody suggested to him that actually, maybe the bus tickets had been dropped by people getting off the bus because their journey was over and that they certainly didn't reflect the fact that the hammer cop had picked them up a hundred miles away where the journey started. So more about that there. You can read about in the hammer cop bit a lot more about what was people did with their nests. Um, there's a very sad story, which I'm not going to tell here. It's, you're probably familiar with it, a lot of you in South Africa. But I tell it in the, in the Battler story about this British Army officer who was a brilliant artist um, and whose pictures were actually copied by Lighton into Roberts's Birds of South Africa. But the British uh, Army officer stole a lot of pictures out of books and um, uh, was eventually disgraced, died in the castle in Cape Town. His wife went off to live in, in um, obscurity in Ireland, but his wonderful pictures lingered on. They were left in the Transvaal Museum. And there's a very good book about that story, which I commend to anyone. Or we'll just read the story. There's many versions of it. Uh, and I think finally I'll close with 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 counting with the Egyptian geese um, uh, and 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 their ability to count question mark the um, there was a South African uh, writer um, researcher called Mr Milstein who found a pair of Egyptian geese uh, that had taken over a, an abandoned white front-breasted cormorant's nest on the edge of a reservoir in the Free State. Um, and from his boat, he could see that there were nine, nine uh, goslings in the boat, in the nest. Um, and he wanted to witness them leaving because they throw themselves out of the nest, seemingly um, with no concern. Uh, and seem to all, whether they land on water or, or land, they seem unharmed by their descent. Anyway, so he arrives the next morning and he finds that all is quiet. The sitting female is unconcerned by anything going on round about. Until about eight o'clock, the, the, the male bird moves closer to the nest and calls to his mate. Um, and the goose then comes to the edge of the nest, jumps off the nest into the water, and then starts um, hissing at the little ones to try and encourage them to, to follow. And she hisses and honks, and the first one comes, and the second one comes, and she keeps hissing and keeps honking and keeps hissing and keeps honking until all nine have jumped and then she stops. And what I found so interesting about this paper was that, all right, that was a nice bit of witnessing what, what, what he'd seen, but he immediately asks, could she count? Because as soon as the ninth had come down onto the water, she stopped hissing and honking and set off away from the nest with the little ones. And that is, is, is a really interesting observation. And it led me to, to look a bit more at 
um, at, at birds counting. Um, there's a lot of articles about whether crows can count, but one of the other really interesting things I, I found out about was about a paper by two English ladies called Counting Cormorants. And they went and looked at the Chinese cormorant fishermen. And the cormorants that the Chinese fishermen have, there, they go off and they go and fish and they bring a, 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 a fish back and then they go and catch another one and then they go and catch another one. And they are allowed to eat every eighth fish. However, they absolutely adamantly refuse to go and do any more fishing after they'd caught seven because they knew that they were allowed to eat the eighth fish. And so they then raised the question again, could the cormorants count? Could the Egyptian geese count? Who knows? Lovely that people's minds go off into those dimensions. And so I think um, I'll leave the story about the pintailed wider and uh, its um, habits of nesting in other birds' nests. Uh, for you to read in the book. There's the Egyptian goose, there's the pintail wider. And I'll say thank you all very much indeed for listening. I hope I haven't gone on too long, too late if I have. Um, that was going to be my closing slide because that's a, a bird that we all recognize well, south and north, although I fear that they're also under threat from habitat loss um, and so with the uh, secretary bird come to my closing slide thank you all very much indeed for bearing with me thank you john and thank you belinda also for everything that you've done to try to get all this together and the other ladies at strike and custom Bosch and the gentlemen at strike as well thank you all Excellent, excellent, excellent. I think um, uh, this uh, wonderful presentation deserves a, a big round of applause. And I'm sure if we are all together, we would be so, we would be standing on our feet now and really thank you for your wonderful uh, presentation. Now, um, this talk was proudly brought to you by Strake um, in collaboration with Kirsten Bosch and Sandy. Uh, we've been live on various social media platforms. We are on Zoom, we are on Facebook. So please follow the Straight Nature Facebook page uh, and also follow the Kirsten Bosch page. Uh, we've got um, some lovely comments um, all over our social media pages. Uh, we've got Mr. Shane Jackson on Facebook, um, really loving the talk. We've got Audrey uh, Buota, uh, loving it, saying this is absolutely awesome we've got Rolene Hugh on Facebook showing thumbs up saying this is absolutely fantastic we've got Eric Makubela uh, also on Facebook loving it we've got um, uh, Gareth uh, uh, Coombs um, on our Zoom platform that's joining us now uh, saying this is great story of early adventuring and biogeography uh, we've got Sherry Woods saying great talk so informative greatly enjoyed it uh, we've got uh, Johan Hart saying thank you beautiful illustrations so we've got endless of comments and I'm telling you we are buzzing with them with just uh, you know uh, words of encouragement everybody saying this was an absolute absolute excellent presentation we've got um, one specific question from Mr. Johan Ruthman who says um, can you please ask Mr. Rupert to give us the proper pronunciation of his book title, please, <laughs> if you may. <laughs> Peacocks and Picathartes. Oh, can you just repeat that one more time? <laughs> Peacocks and Picathartes. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Mr. Johan, I hope you heard that. Uh, that was absolutely ex ex exciting and, and really, really informative. Um, I just have one... Um, uh, two announcements uh, just to make uh, before I let everybody go. So uh, with me, I've got the beautiful book. Um, 
and I encourage everybody to go and get this book. Uh, in fact, Straight Nature is giving everyone that's attending the talk today a 15% discount on this beautiful book. Uh, the offer is valid until the end of the week. Um, if you'd like to make contact and make sure that you reserve this book for your collection, you can contact Mr. Greg on 021-762-1621. Uh, his email address details are also posted on the chat uh, here on Zoom. We'll also post uh, some of this information, hopefully on Facebook, if Belinda allows. Uh, but everybody that's on the talk today that has joined us, uh, you get a fantastic 15% discount, offer valid until the end of the week. We encourage you guys um, to make contact with our Kistenbosch uh, bookshop uh, and make sure that you... Uh, reserve this book. It can either be couriered to you via Postnet uh, or you can purchase it and we can keep it for you and you can collect it here at the beautiful gardens. This talk has been absolutely amazing, Mr. Rupert. Um, I don't even know what to say. Uh, you've taken us on a journey uh, of Africa, really showing us, highlighting the beautiful birds. And I have to say, where you are right now, I mean, I'm hearing birds singing, uh, there's helicopters going. What a beautiful surrounding. I think all of us uh, that are watching the talk are really, really uh, envious of where you are currently. Um, without any waste of time, uh, our next Wednesday talk will be announced soon. Thank you to everybody that has joined us today on Facebook as well as, as, well as here on the Zoom platform. Uh, we will share details of our next talk and we will embrace this new normal. Um, and connect uh, with each other virtually. So without any waste of time, thank you very much uh, to you, Mr. Rupert Watson. We thank, thank you very you so much for your beautiful uh, adventures and taking us on this beautiful journey um, on reflections of African birds. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you too. Thank you all. Excellent. With that said, have a fantastic uh, weekend, long weekend coming up, everybody. Um, we wish to see you guys uh, walking into Kistenbosch again soon. Stay safe. Remember to sanitize. Let's protect one another. And um, even within this great uh, pandemic, uh, we can still get together um, and really share these beautiful presentations uh, together. So uh, stay safe. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you guys again soon at Kistenbosch. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a fantastic day. Cheers. Bye.